Hello, book burners, and welcome to another episode of Books Are Burning. I'm your host, Mark Will, in Taipei, and I'm joined once again by Mr. G.J. Villa in an undisclosed location. How are you today, sir? Uh, good. Here from the uh, bunker, the undisclosed bunker. Doing pretty well. The bunker. All right. That's well, right. Once again, we will be discussing uh, Benjamin Labatut's When We Cease to Understand the World. And this is our fourth episode. So today we look at the fourth section of this book. Um, and this section is actually also called When We Cease to Understand the World. Of course, that's in English translation. The uh, Spanish, original Spanish title is Un Verdor Terrible, a terrible green or a terrifying green. Uh, do you want to comment on the title that uh, was chosen for the English version? I think we may have touched upon this before, but yeah, remind people uh, what that's about. Well, La Batute is utterly fluent in English. Um, and in an interview I saw with him, he said that a terrible green or a terrible greenness didn't quite convey the same, perhaps, uh, connotations, rhythm, rhythm as un verdor terrible. And so they went with when we cease to understand the world, which is the heart of the novel, right? Uh, and the section that will be the chapter that we'll be discussing today. It's been described as a novella, right? I mean, it's it's the lengthiest part of the book for right. sure. Yes, yeah, and possibly my favorite. Um, uh, I mean, the thing is an interesting book as we've been talking, right? Uh, it is hybrid. Uh, it is a weird composite whole, but you can take each piece individually as well, right? Um, but yes, he said that while Prussian Blue was in the register of um, an essay, right, kind of histo sweeping historical philosophical essay, uh, this is uh, in the register of a novella. So what is it, about 100 pages maybe, or if that... Um, Something like that, yeah. Digestible and one good reading, um, uh, but certainly longer than the other pieces in the novel, right? Uh, and the fact that in the English translation, they chose to use the title of this section, When We Cease to Understand the World, as the novel title also, I think, suggests its centrality. Uh, I, so we're now in the realm of quantum physics, Yes, and in the preface, we'll just jump right in. There are several sections to this fourth section of the book, so subsections, I guess we could say. So it right. begins with a preface, and in the preface, uh, basically, we see that there will be a kind of conflict between the ideas of Schrodinger and Heisenberg, right? So Schrodinger... Right. Uh, is basically arguing for the wave theory of uh, quantum physics. And Heisenberg's uh, theory is based neither on waves nor particles, but as we'll find out later, something called matrices, which is like a purely mathematical conception. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not a physicist by any means, so... Uh, I'm not sure I understand everything uh, completely, but do I have that much right? You do. You do indeed. And uh, nor am I a physicist or scientist, but I do like the ideas that quantum physics generates, certainly, right? Um, they spill over into a kind of strange mysticism. But uh, yeah, to your uh, point about the way in which Labatut frames this section, it's a letter from Heisenberg to Wolfgang Pauli. Uh, and the quote is, the more I reflect on the physical part of Schrodinger's equation, the more disgusting I find it. What Schrodinger writes makes scarcely any sense. In other words, I think it's bullshit. Now, to me, you know, having read and then reread this book and looked closely at this section, if you were to pluck that quote out to someone who's read that section, right? And said, this quote is either by Schrodinger or Heisenberg. 
I suspect most people would think that that is a letter Schrodinger wrote about Heide, uh, Heisenberg because Schrodinger's wave function, right, uh, at least gave the ability to visually conceptualize, right, what's happening in that subatomic world. Uh, there was an elegance to it that's much lauded and so on, right? Whereas Heisinger's, Heisenberg's matrices dispense with all metaphor, with all visualizations of the interiors. And in fact, um, uh, that the matrices are represented as being kind of revolting uh, beyond the human scope in a way that the wave, you know, Schrodinger's wave uh, uh, um, conceptualization isn't. So it's interesting that, you know, this quote, and let's assume it's a real one, right? Um, uh, where we have Heisenberg talking about the disgusting nature of Schrodinger's uh, uh, model, which scarcely makes sense and which is bullshit. That seems to me like the, the visceral reaction that was uh, uh, that Heisenberg's matrices inspired, right? Because at least in this book, right, um, when the uh, when, when Schrodinger puts out his wave function, that is a big breakthrough celebration. Even Einstein, they're all right, they acknowledge it's 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 not just its profundity, but its elegance, right? Well, we'll talk about Einstein's. Uh, rather petulant reaction to the theories of Heisenberg, but yeah, he was he was yeah. he was definitely, I guess you could say, on the side of Schrödinger. And just so we're clear about who we're talking about, once again, these are real historical characters. So, can you guess who this is? That is young Heisenberg. Uh, actually, this no, is Schrödinger. Schrodinger. That's that's Schrödinger. That's right. That's yeah. right. With, right, the high, right, right. with the high forehead that the right, right, that right, the right. women supposedly admired, although it's the, hard to the understand very young why. Women, the very young women, given well, that, yes. pedophilic tendencies, which Labatut takes on in a very interesting way. We will yeah. get to that. Yeah. And uh, here's a picture of Heisenberg. Ah, uh, yes, of course. There he is. Actually, it's this guy. Right. Okay, so these are our two protagonists, I guess you could say. Uh, there are some some other uh, luminaries that play important roles in this narrative, but it's basically about the uh, academic, philosophical, scientific uh, viewpoints of those two, Schrodinger and Heisenberg. So uh, after the preface, the next section is Night in Heligoland, uh, which translates to Holy Land. And it's, and it's an island off the coast of Germany, apparently the only island that's part of Germany. And uh, this is where, as Labatut tells us, Heisenberg had become a monster. So he's on this island. He has a terrible allergic reaction. His face is puffed up. Uh, the uh, landlady at the guest house where he's staying is concerned about him. Um, he's he's ill. He's frustrated. He thinks he's a failure. And then what happens? Well, we have the classic Labatutian theme, I guess we've explored already, of uh, a kind of descent into delirium and madness and obsession and so on the the scientist uh as a kind of raging mystic if you will right so i mean i think that's one one of the things that happens right um uh, and we saw this with grot and deek in the, right. the heart of the heart this uh right sort of relationship between the man of science and the the mystic yeah, and we see that throughout, he does it again with both Heisenberg and Schrodinger, both of whom have uh, hallucinatory, hallucinatory sort of experiences. Um, mystic Heisenberg visions. Here, mystic visions that are also obscene, right? Um, so here we have him dreaming of Goethe, you know, giving a blowjob to Hafez, the the mystic and so on, right? Persian I wonder poet. If you, the Persian poet, right? Um, uh, 
who's described this is, as having this been this is a... inspired by his reading of Goethe's uh, West Eastern Divan, which right was and, and this was, is in a moment uh, of crisis, right? So this is a moment of crisis where he is uh, um, just straining to break through this into this world of the matrices and under, un, unlock the quantum world. And then he has this, and he's sick, as you mentioned, and so on. And then he has this delirious dream, right? But you were saying about the Goethe book. Well, East, it's West. A, the West Eastern Divan is a German translation. I'm not sure how how literal. Uh, I think it's something of a loose translation. But it, regardless, it's a German translation of the Persian poet uh, Hafez. And he collaborated right. on it, apparently, with the wife of his good friend and they they kind of had like a a pen pal relationship that became somewhat eroticized we don't get right. all the details of that but um you know they they were apparently excited by the uh project of collaborating on this translation from the persian right. But yeah, as Very you say, nice. as you say, uh, uh, Heisenberg has these erotic dreams, homoerotic dreams, I guess you could say, with, yeah. with Goethe yeah. and and uh, Hafez. But uh, out of out of this hallucinatory experience, he he believes that he's found the solution to his problem in physics and so once right. again once again and before that he thinks he's an absolute failure maybe he's he's going mad uh maybe he's an absolute fool so w once again we have this this uh ambiguity about the wise man and the fool or madness and genius you know which again we saw in the Grotendieck section right and, and and really throughout the book i would say so heisenberg is associated with Habes, right the mystic who's described as having been a drunken saint a mystic and a hedonist right hardly words that one would use to describe a scientist right um and then in that surreal dream in which goethe ends up sucking the cock of the corpse i believe of habits <laughs> it's very very strange well, trying, right? to revive, uh, trying to revive trying to revive trying to revive him right uh uh the words are hissed out go out and submerge yourself in god's sea right and so it's after this crazy vision where he then makes a breakthrough with the matrices and so on but uh this mystical notion of the undifferentiated the the sea uh uh Indra's net, for example, that's referenced later when Schrodinger has his uh, his his sort of a uh, hallucinatory experience, right? The the expansiveness of the universe. So it seems to me that's Labatut's way of, of of showcasing the inner drama, the turmoil um, of the scientist who makes this unprecedented break with Newtonian physics and um, uh, sees the sort of chance submerged at the heart of things and of ever sort of uncertain mutating universe stability is gone at this point right and it's this mystic vision that takes one to the breakthrough it's fascinating stuff right it's delightful and strange well um i think uh throughout the book i've i've noticed this uh in addition to the the other things we discuss madness and genius um you know the fool and the wise man there's sort right. of an ambiguity about science and poetry uh right. and again that's emphasized here you know he and uh th that is heisenberg and his mentor the dane niels bohr there, there he, he is. is there he is um right you know they agreed that uh science uh scientific discourse was kind of symbolic and almost poetic uh, when discussing atoms, language could serve as nothing more than a kind of poetry, one of them said, and the other agreed. And then the physicist, like the poet, should not describe the facts of the world, but rather generate mm. metaphors and mental connections. So 
again, I've been that is, arguing where, where that. Where was that quote? Where was that quote from? Sorry, say again. Uh, that's this section. Uh, that's page pages ninety six and ninety seven in my text. Well, what was the context again? Well, Niels Bohr and Heisenberg okay, were right, talking right, about right, got the, it. the role of of scientific discourse, or or you know the 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 theories of the physicists, right? right? Like right, they, basically, right, gotcha. we, we okay. can't we can't uh, argue that we have objectivity on our side. We're speaking metaphorically, and so we, right. like poets, we're suggesting truths rather than describing literal reality i guess you could say right um that's interesting i'll just interject very quickly that in one of the interviews i watched and i believe i mentioned this in a previous episode that uh lavatut's fondness for nabokov's claim that a writer needs to have the precision of a poet and the imagination of a scientist right and in the, the way in which he talks about he likes the way that those the terms are sort of inverted one would think imagination goes with poet right Mm. Um, uh, and that precision goes with scientists, but it's sort of, he was talking about the, the way in which science itself breakthroughs in science require imagination, right? Uh, and in this case, uh, the sort of extreme form of imagination would be these delirious, mystical, irrational breakthroughs, right? Things that, that are by nature unscientific, right? Yeah, but they're <clears throat> but they're similar to visions that poets and artists have, right, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I've I've been arguing throughout that these portraits of famous scientists are in a sense <clears throat> allegories of the writer. And uh yeah, there's some more absolutely. there are some more explicit uh examples of that later in this section. But I, I think uh I noticed that at the beginning and throughout the entire work and definitely in right. this section too. I just want to point out that uh, in addition to the erotic dreams that uh, Heisenberg has, he suffered from insomnia. We talked about how Grotendieck was able to sleep anytime, anywhere. Oh, you know, right, right, right. He had very irregular sleeping habits and so a lot of these geniuses, whether whether scientific or artistic geniuses, have irregular uh, sleeping habits. Right. Interesting characteristic to note. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. <clears throat> okay. So so um, Bohr uh, believes after Heisenberg sends him his his uh, you know equations or theory that uh he that heisenberg has discovered a new sort of beauty and he he sends it to einstein who is not impressed and actually seems to be like ideologically concerned yeah i would say less i suppose ideologically sure um metaphysically concerned right yeah theologically um, the, the, concerned uh, yeah right exactly the 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 notion that in the heart of things chance nestles in the heart of things that that was a a notion that einstein couldn't abide right and it's easy for us you know in the 21st century with our exposure to the history of ideas in the 20th century and postmodernism and everyone to like think oh what a prude etc but I, I can only imagine how seismic that shift must have been for him and for many at the time, right? But uh, see, his his theory of relativity itself was a challenge to the classical Newtonian idea of physics, right? So, right, it's like he he just wanted to modify Newton's theory, not completely upend it. I'm, I'm yeah, thinking of gonna... I'm thinking of like the you know the the British. Uh, poet's interpretation of newtonian physics like alexander pope you know whatever is is right that mm -hmm. that that notion seems to be related in some way to the discoveries of of newton and mm -hmm. and those who described a kind of mechanistic universe remember it was the universe 
or, and God himself was thought of as a kind of master clockmaker, right? Right. So and then retired, you know, into the firmaments and yeah, let the and let so, the mechanism work on its own. So yeah, uh, just de- let it de- just... Uh, sort of like a the, and then that uh, you know gave rise to deism and so on. Sure, right. And so Einstein challenges that, but he doesn't want to dispense with the notion of I don't know some kind of. Uh, ground of being that controls things right the the prospect of uncertainty and chaos was a step too far from him it seems at right. least how he's no, that, that, depicted that's here. well documented yeah 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 and my point is that's that's understandable right given i think that's how revolutionary quantum physics and its discoveries was right well i think uh i think he's depicted as I used the word petulant before. I mean, he's kind of like a petulant child in Labatut's uh, depiction, you know, as as True. I as I see it, and and he's mocked in other ways too, called the Pope of Physics, which I think we right, alluded right, right. to in another right. episode. And it's kind of like, okay, these are men of science, but they still have their hierarchies and their their kind of authoritarian views, right? Like, yeah. how dare you? challenge the great Einstein and, the, right. and when his when his ideas are challenged he kind of reacts childishly at right. least as it's right. depicted here I'm sure there's a good deal of ego uh wrapped up but um you know Lavatou's depiction of the obsession that goes into this kind of work we can understand how one would uh fiercely defend what one has constructed or discovered however you want to think about it right yeah. yeah, it is true that Einstein, by virtue of not really being a developed character, you know, you just take out some of the quotes and some of his reactions to uh, uh, quantum physics after you have this entire narrative around these two madmen and Bohr and um, the revolutionary nature of what they were doing. Yes, he does come across as uh, a little comically petulant. I think that's fair, right? In but it, but it's, interesting, it's interesting that mainstream culture has embraced him, right? Like everyone knows... Albert Einstein. That's why I didn't even bother to print out a portrait of him. Everyone knows what right. he looks like with his his right. wild, you know, white hair, and he's he's like the the archetypal genius. But these other characters, I mean, Heisenberg now has a certain pop cultural cachet because of his association with Breaking Bad, right? But right. But uh, hey, and, you know, Schrodinger, Schrodinger, Schrodinger has his cat. Don't forget yeah, about that. But but that's not as well known as you know the name Einstein and the theory of relativity, right? Sure, sure. I mean, so, you know what trickles out to the masses? Yes, yeah, that's true. yeah. And I include myself as the masses, by the yeah, way. Yeah, sure, so, sure. I I, mean, I, I knew nothing. I mean, <clears> I may have, <throat> I I had heard some of the names before reading this book, but I knew nothing about them. So that right. and and I think that's because of the you know way that the mainstream culture has chosen to elevate certain figures and not others. Yeah, you know. I mean, so there. Yeah. So that. So even even when we're talking about you know scientific truth, supposedly there's still like a cultural mediation and and certain theories and certain. Uh, figures are promoted and others are not right yeah all right so night in heligoland is about uh heisenberg's revelation on this little island um off the coast of germany the next section is called the prince's waves and here we're talking about the Duke de Broglia. This guy. Look there at him. Is. What a dandy. Indeed. So he uh basically is what? A promoter of wave theory before Schrodinger discovers his equation, right? Right. And he Einstein, apparently, who finds 
Heisenberg's ideas, uh, let's see, the quote is truly repulsive, right? Turns to de Broglie to try to counter that model. So uh, this section is about, was he French? He's French, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, this French scientist's immersion in the laboratory. He himself has, the obsession is once again depicted. There's some surreal moments, right? And then he has his, his breakthrough as well. So there's a sort of similar model, right? Uh, he doesn't rise to the level of hugeness and uh, in a sort of monstrosity and breakthrough as Schrodinger and Heisenberg, but he's clearly, a, I think Labatut is trying to depict the way in which these breakthroughs uh, were rocking the sort of European scientific establishment. And there was this jousting to try to uh, compete, right, for what is the way to represent the world and uh, how can we counter Heisenberg's theories. The way it's presented here, as I mentioned, is that uh, uh, de Broglie is sort of enlisted upon by, by Einstein to make discoveries that can counter that one. Who described Heisenberg's theory as a devilish calculation. Mm -hmm. Someone right. had to stop him. Someone had to smash the box in which Heisenberg had trapped <laughs> the atom so that's yeah. a great that's a great line yeah the, the urgency the there building. that's right that's right uh and, and that's labatut also right you know kind of cranking up the the uh, the plot and the narrative and the drama of what mm -hmm. happened right mm -hmm. um you know certainly far more interesting than reading the sort of wikipedia page on you know competing models in the quantum world well, let's talk about that that breakdown, because as you say, like the other scientist uh, protagonists in this book, um, or like many of the others, there is a kind of psychological breakdown crisis uh, followed by insight, right? Right. So what what led to his breakdown? Uh, well, I mean, the first thing he, he turns to the laboratory, he has a laboratory in his, his, his estate, I believe, right? His brother's um, a physicist too. His brother's a physicist. It almost seems like he falls into the laboratory and just becomes an addict from the beginning. Uh, we're told that with frightening speed, he had turned into an austere man leading a monastic life. So the way it's depicted is that he gets into the laboratory and just it is submerged into it, right? Um, so the addiction to laboratory work, right, is what then leads to further break breakthroughs and breakdowns and so on, right? And he has the means to do this, to pursue this interest. Why? Because he was born to the aristocracy. He's a member of the right. idle rich class. He can do whatever right. the fuck he wants. And it turns out <laughs> he's interested in physics. Right, right. Exactly. However, uh, however, he he spends some time in the military, um, and Labatou tells us by nature he was a coward and a pacifist, um, which is an interesting detail. But uh, while while serving in the military, he befriends uh, Jean Baptiste Vazek, who is a kind of artist, and uh, a promoter of the art brute, you know, it's like what's called outsider art. Uh, this is art uh, created by the insane, by sex offenders, by uh, denizens of uh, asylums and mental institutions, prisoners, criminals. So we have a sort of romanticizing of the criminal, the insane, right? the unhinged well there again the there's the the close connection between madness and genius right 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 which which sometimes can smack up a little bit of uh again uh a, a romantic perhaps naive notion given what we know now more about mental illness but regardless right this is in service of narrative right um yeah so his friend Commits suicide, right? Uh, de Broglie's friend Vasek commits suicide, uh, and, and, and and it's believed that de Broglie was in love with this friend, right? Not just a homoerotic, yeah, right, right, right. Maybe, maybe uh, 
was never able to express that. Who knows? But in response to his friend's suicide, and this is, I believe, fictionalizing, I would, I would imagine it becomes insane. He starts madly collecting all the artistic work of asylum patients throughout France, right? Uh, as a sort of homage, right, uh, mm -hmm. to his lost friend, fulfilling his life work. Um, uh, and he puts it in his sort of palatial estate. Uh, and you have all of these weird, weirdly depicted uh, examples of that art brut. Is that what it is, right? From all of these uh, uh, insane folks. Uh, and the centerpiece in the main exhibition hall, <laughs> it, we're told that there was a perfect replica of the Cathedral of Notre Dame down to the features of its smallest gargoyle wrought entirely in human feces. Uh, right. So uh, that kind of punctuated a uh, imaginative of shit. flourish. He made a church of shit. But uh, it is interesting, you know, the idea of aesthetic productions, right, uh, connected somehow with the scatological here, right, the two antipodes, the two sort of extremes of, of the human realm, right? Uh, art is that which flowers from our most sort of uh, elevated self, right, if you will, right? It's a, what makes us closer to the gods we can create, right? And yet we are brute animals that just shit, right? So there you have these Notre Dame, right, uh, the, the symbol of... Uh, uh, you know, human artistry on the highest scale, rot in shit, right? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if there's something, how, how that may or may not connect with uh, uh, the rest of the narrative, but it's a striking image. Um, it felt a little bit out of uh, Roberto Bolaño, which, you know, one of our favorites, right? Mm. Um, uh, he has these sort of explosions of the surreal on the page, right? Um, uh, 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 and it does seem to obviously reflect that theme we've been talking about, the artist uh, or the the scientist, the kind of maniac, the madman and so on. Right. But, um, uh, anyway, he does that for his friend before getting back to his laboratory. And I guess that's just another way of depicting perhaps fleshing out the character a little bit more. Right. Um, uh, uh, you know, his homoerotic sort of connection with his friend, his, 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 his mania, uh, et cetera. Well, and, and, uh, after this, uh, breakdown or this manic episode, as you say, he returns to his work and he discovers or believes he discovers that light exists in two different waves, in two different ways, W-A-Y-S. As wave and as particle, it inhabits two distinct orders and is possessed of identities as opposed as the two faces of Janus. Mm. So this is, is. Uh, basically... Uh, an attempt to prove Einstein's particle wave duality. Hmm. For right. each particle of matter, electron or proton, there exists an associated wave that transports it through space. Right. So there's kind of a, a synthesis that he does to, to resolve some of the conflicts in the, the, uh, the scientific community of that time uh you know it's not either or it's both and uh particle it, and wave and then i think it's schrodinger who takes that to the next level with his wave function right uh but yes yes uh it, and then heisenberg who asserts or is it schrodinger uh, but, but and the sort of essence of quantum the quantum world is that say with a a quantum state you can measure its location but not its velocity or vice versa right you can't do both at the same time and here my lack of scientific rigor i'm sure comes across quite strongly right but that uncertainty that's sort of built into the essence of things right? you can measure a particle right uh, but not as that's what it is you can measure a particle but not its velocity right or you can measure its velocity but not its location you can't do both. Once you start measuring for one, right, the other is inaccessible to you. You measure for you know, um, movement, location is not there, and vice versa. Hmm. Okay, well, let's uh, save that for our discussion of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. First, uh, we go to the next section 
called Pearls in His Ears. And this is the story of Schrodinger. Uh, so like de Broglie, uh, Schrodinger spends some time in the military. Um, and he's described as afraid of engaging in real combat. What What is Labatut trying to say about, you know, bravery or the lack thereof when right. when he's describing these or or maybe that's just like common sense you know don't don't try to be a hero in modern warfare it won't end well it, right. you're, you're better off pursuing scientific and artistic uh questions but then then military said, glory right when we think of the book as a whole that stands in contrast to the hero of part two, right? Schwarzschild. I don't, I don't think I'm pronouncing his name. The, the singular, the man who discovered the singularity, right? Who was serving uh, on the Russian front during World War I uh, and did so out of sincere patriotism, right? But that is in contrast to what you were just saying about Schrodinger here. Well, but he came to despair of not only his side of the conflict, but the entire uh, notion of modern warfare and modern civilization. Right. You know, he right. he developed this fatalistic doom and gloom attitude, which I would say was inspired largely by his experiences on the battlefield. So it's not like he he was a a promoter of military values no. like at no, the no, end, no. by the end by the end i mean in the beginning he he seemed to have been inspired by genuine True. patriotism but right. he changed his tune later anyway so, i mean and that, that's a bigger thing right the effects of world war one on an entire generation right um and the pessimism it um it created and so on certainly that's right. part of the novel too well also uh we talked about um, Heisenberg's insomnia. Uh, I thought this was an interesting detail. Schrodinger would not rise before lunchtime and then took naps that lasted the entire afternoon. That's my kind of schedule. All nighters. Yeah. Night the owl life. The, the vampires. That's vampires right. of the world unite. That's right, indeed. Night indeed. owls. Okay, so um, he has some kind of uh, vision of St. Elmo's fire, which reminds me of the tiny ember of light that, that Heisenberg catches in his hands later. So there, there are a lot of uh, parallel details in these narratives. Yeah, I found. maybe we should uh, establish the, the context for all of this, uh, this entire part of the book. It is the longest part, this, this, this chapter in the novella, right? Um, if, as you will, right, which um, on Schrodenberg is the longest, right? Uh, and it's set in uh, one uh, Dr. Herwig's sanatorium, right, mm. uh, in the Alpines. Uh, and there, many people of that generation would take these retreats, right, um, and to get the fresh air of, of, of the mountains. And I couldn't well, that's help the, thinking that's that, the background of Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, right? That's, that's what I was going to say. I immediately thought of the magic mountain, um, the idea of uh, visions and madness during a extended convalescence in a mountain region, you know, you're isolated from the world. Uh, and so just metaphorically, that notion of being removed from the world in a kind of almost ethereal realm where the imagination can run wild and mystical visions can occur. And um, that's where he has his breakthroughs. Uh, and it's strangely, uh, happens through his relationship with Dr. Herwig's, is it pre-adolescent, 13-year-old? No, she's or barely she's, adolescent. How old is she? She's 16. How old is she? she's okay, 16. she's a, a respectable 16. Yeah. Right? Um, but she's, <laughs> she's, she's depicted as a, a, a sickly, strange girl who has her own uh, somehow knowledge of uh, um, uh, Vedantic thought and so on, right? So it's, it, it, it's, again we're in the realm of the surreal and the grotesque and uh certainly Labatut is 
dramatizing the way in which this guy uh, is uh, was known to is known now to have been a pedophile, right? Um, and so he takes that. Tell us what you know about uses that. that. Well, I mean, no more than you could probably know by going to Wikipedia, right? Um, that it's only come out in the last, I don't know, fairly recently, right? That uh, this information about him that has been long kind of pushed under the rug, that he he enjoyed young women. Hmm. Not even young women, girls. But I mean, yeah. maybe we should do a quick Google search, right? But uh, but anyway, Labatou mentions the controversy about his pedophilic ways uh, and, and history and so on and the way that he uses that here, right? With uh, being highly suggestive, even though he and Miss Herwig never consummate sexually, they do in some weird, psychotic, metaphysical fashion, right? Well, is, she's this, kind of dying. Uh, is, she, is she a fictional... I mean, clearly this is fictional lies, but is she... A, a real historical character. I didn't bother to look her up. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Right. And I yeah. probably should have done more due diligence here. Right. Um, in terms of looking a little bit more closely at what exactly are the charges. I, against I just took her to be but... a fictionalized version of all the, you know, <laughs> inappropriate obsessions that. Yes. Schrodinger that's, that's, is a, that's thought to have point. had. That's the way to put it perhaps. Right. His, uh, yeah. A fictionalized grotesque metaphor for his uh, pedophilic uh, tendencies, let's say. I really like how uh, Schopenhauer's philosophy is presented as an inspiration for his ideas in physics. Um, he It says he read the writings of Schopenhauer through whom he came to know the philosophy, the philosophy of Vedanta. So he's like getting these Hindu uh, concepts from Schopenhauer, which are influencing his thinking. And he comes to believe that every individual manifestation is only a reflection of Brahman, the absolute reality that underlies the phenomena of the world. Right, right. So again, we have Eastern meta mysticism, right, um, inspiring these scientific breakthroughs right um yeah later he has a nightmare schopenhauer has a not schopenhauer schodenberg has a nightmare about the goddess kali yes and uh miss herwig uh the girl with whom he's infatuated dr herwig's daughter corrects him and says that that's not a nightmare but a blessing this this uh this image of this grotesque goddess right uh who seems to symbolize death and destruction and so on uh, so I guess we get this notion of the creation that comes out of destruction, I suppose, right? Um, and perhaps that's a apt metaphor for these quantum breakthroughs, the destruction of the stable Newtonian world, right? Uh, and then the creation of this new weird world of probabilities, right? And uncertainties. But there's still a kind of unifying principle you know it, it could either be thought of as einstein's god that doesn't play dice or brahman the unifying right. principle right like right all of the phenomena that we observe are really just aspects of brahman right yeah there's a great passage page 138 that i, I pulls it together where uh schrodenberg is having a vision and um it's Hinduism meets quantum physics, basically, where uh, and it says those multiple waves would be the first glimpse of something completely new, each a brief flash of a universe that was born when the electron leapt from one state to the other, branching out to populate the infinite like the jewels of Indra's net. Mm. That is just gorgeous, right? But yeah. That vision of the inner world is not being stable at all, but a realm of possibilities and permutations, right? Um, the net, Indra's net is never static, right? It is always branching out and, and, and encompassing everything, right? Very it's beautiful. Kind of like, kind of like the Japanese concept of the floating world, you mm. know, which is, which is all just a kind of Maya. It's, it's right. all just a right. hallucination. 
right it's not there's no reality there it's just external phenomena which uh i guess you could say uh are just reflections of brahman or brahma right right uh yeah by the end of this chapter we have this notion that we're told that it's the end of determinism and that uh we're now in a, a domain of wonders and rarities born of the whims of a many armed goddess toying with chance. Well, but that's uh, the, that's the Heisenberg uh, and, and Bohr notion, right? That's the well, Cop it's, Copenhagen it's but, interpretation. But remember that's the, that, that's complementarity, right? Bohr was the one who took these two models, right? Um, yeah. The matrices of Heisenberg and uh, um, the wave function of Schrodenberg and, said that they are two ways of accessing this inner world. They were complementary with each other, right? So, well, anyhow, yeah. so, but, but that, that image of the armed goddess toying with chance, you have the evocations of, you know, the European lady fortune and a, just a variety of Hindu goddesses there, right? But that's a, 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 a beautiful poetic image of right. the quantum but, world. But I want to say it's like, that is in contrast to the Einsteinian, yes, yes, yes yeah, of Einsteinian, course, Einsteinian, and right, and since Schrödinger is on Einstein's side, as it were, it's it's sort of well, a retort he, to his views as well. He wanted to be, but ultimately wasn't, right? Okay, I mean, how he, so? He, he didn't he craft the Schrödinger's cat experiment as a way to uh, discredit the uncertainty that Heisenberg had unlocked, but ultimately it actually credits it. Well, but he, but his intention was to discredit it. That's and, what I'm saying. But ultimately, yeah, yeah. now that we, now that we think about, I mean, okay, back to that, you know, what do we know about pop, you know, in popular culture, dumbasses like ourselves, what trickles down Schrodinger's cat, right? The cat is alive and dead, right? Mm. Whatever that means. Right. But it's a state it's, it, both at the same time. Schrodinger's thought experiment was supposed to just, express the absurdity of that right right but ultimately that absurd state has not been refuted to this day so in a way schrodinger's cat nobody thinks about about it as a way to expose the absurdity of the quantum state now we think about it dumbasses like us as that's that is the paradox the 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 <laughs> ridiculous the, the you know uh abstruse paradox of the heart of things so but did he admit schrodinger, that did he admit that well let's see i don't know let's see uh Continue talking, and I think well, but, uh, uh, before, here it is. Here it is. Okay. Uh, and at the very end, Schrodinger too came to detest quantum mechanics. He contrived an elaborate thought experiment, uh, uh, the result of which was an apparently impossible creature, a cat that was at once alive and dead. His intention was to promote, demonstrate the ridiculous character of this manner of thinking. The proponents of the Copenhagen interpretation told Schrodinger that he was absolutely right. The result was not only ridiculous, but paradoxical. And yet, it was true. Schrodinger's cat, like any elementary particle, was alive and dead, at least until it was measured. And the Austrian's name would remain associated forever with his failed attempt to negate the ideas he himself had helped to give rise to. There it is. Exactly. But, I mean, he's discredited. Joke's on but, him. Yeah, but, but does he admit it? So I, I'm saying I, I think I, mean, I think I think he still was a partisan of the Einsteinian uh, well, viewpoint. That's fine, but I mean we are told. Let me go back to that same page, right? It says afterward after what I just read. Um, let's see. Uh, after this, uh, he uh, he made contributions to biology, genetics, thermodynamics, and general relativity, but never again produced anything comparable to what he had done during the six months following his stay in Villa Herwig, nor did he ever return there. So the idea is that he by, had to by, admit by defeat. implication, he didn't admit it, but he went on to make do minor things in these other fields, but could never re-enter the debate and win it. Exactly. So I mean, I, that's I, a conceding, I, that's a conceding of defeat there. Okay. Right? Yeah. But I, I say he did admitted, he, say it? I he was admitted wrong, defeat. like in language. I mean, I don't, I don't know, right? But I mean, the the, the actions certainly uh, tell us all we need to know. Yeah, I mean, he admitted defeat, maybe not uh, literally, but but right, uh, right. by by he he conceded 
by no longer engaging in the debate, I guess. Because but, he couldn't. Uh, but his he had been a fierce partisan up until then, right? Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. fact that he stopped suggests he couldn't get around it. He right? gave, I cannot, he gave I cannot up. Cannot he credibly. Gave up. Right, right, right. Um, so that's not, that's that's the uh, the story that's told in this section, right? This uh, <laughs> this uh, kind of clashing scientific theories and the 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 angst around it, and in the end, quantum physics, right? Uh, the uh, is a, is an example of when we cease to understand the world. We can't fully understand it, right? And it is the heart of the novel. It is the longest section. And to me, I would say probably for me personally, the most compelling. I mean, the whole novel holds together as a coherent whole, but this is, uh, to me, was I think the most enthralling because it was the most infused by surrealistic fictionalizing mm -hmm. in a way that the other sections aren't. Uh three things I want to mention before we move to the next section. Um, Schrodinger and his wife took numerous lovers, but each tolerated the other's infidelities and they lived together in peace. Uh, and we've already talked about his uh, tendencies towards pedophilia. Uh, what is Labatut saying about the sexuality of men of genius Remember the the Grotendieck descriptions as well. Uh, yeah, he was bisexual, I believe, right, and um, pretty promiscuous. Uh, De Broglie was perhaps a closeted homosexual, right? Um, I'm not sure if the other uh, who else do we have in here in the mix? Heisenberg to me is perhaps the most monstrous in some ways in term in terms of Labatut's depiction, but the there is that allusion to a kind of uh, perhaps suppressed homosexuality, right? Uh, in terms of that vision he has of Chavez and Goethe. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure. What could we say here in terms of those depictions, at least, right? The, the, these are unconventional men, not well, only in terms of again, their ideas, but also in terms of their sexualities. And their, their sleeping habits and on and on. You know, it's like the the man of genius is not normal he's he's not gonna right. i mean i said the man of genius it could apply to a woman of genius or a but the fact is these are all men, person of right? genius of yeah, course sure. of course but that's the, what we're this, talking about in this book we're talking about and and these are the the white european men were those who were engaged in this revolutionary work yeah. at the time right but anyway. yeah and so, so you know they they don't lead conventional lives they they live outside of the norm and maybe it's because of that that they're able to bring a different perspective to things i think yeah. he's suggesting that um sure did you notice that uh the daughter the daughter of the doctor at this sanatorium miss herwig the love interest let's call her yeah yeah um she collects these insects, right? And then her father um, orders her apparently to destroy them, I guess, because they would infest the hospital. But uh, did you notice what she killed them with? What was that? A pesticide that stained the glass. Oh, right. Such a striking shade of blue. It seemed as though she were looking at the primordial color of the sky. Call back to... The first section, Prussian blue, Prussian blue, and the right. Blauzeura or uh, blue acid cyanide. Right, right. That, fact, that was a nice detail. There, there's. It refers back to that opening section. It refers also to the upcoming section uh, when we have this image of nature's monstrous fecundity. Mm. Um, uh, Miss Herwig is watching, we're told, a female aphid spawn dozens of tiny offspring. And these new creatures were themselves gestating while still inside their mother. Three generations were nestled inside the other, a sort of dreadful Russian doll, a super organism that embodied nature's tendency to overabundance. Striking and grotesque image, right? Uh, um, uh, and, and a kind of image of this spawning nature right which 
foreshadowing that last section verdor we'll terrible yeah. and the verdor terrible right this super abundance and so on which uh um you know i wonder if it's also being associated with the super abundance of the scientific mind right uh and the way it goes into realms of delirium and madness and breakthroughs and whatnot hmm. well um the last thing i should mention is the pearls alluded to in the title pearls in his ears um what are those uh what are they i think they're aren't they literal uh at one point uh miss herwig puts pearls in her ears on um yeah and, then and then afterwards then... afterwards she monologues about how she lost her fear of the dark in one of these cryptic little two-page well she has you know, pearl earrings she right. has pearl earrings she takes them off she she removes the pearls from the clasp and puts right. them in his ears so that he's not disturbed by the uh you know christmas or winter solstice celebrations right, right. right. a minor detail uh i lied one more thing greek nope greek psi or psi is his symbol for the wave function which nobody has been able to unravel nobody has been a, nobody has been able to unravel the mystery of the wave function so apparently the the mathematical equation works but no one understands it right right yeah that struck me and of course i was trying to strain to understand that right yeah uh, something that works and um but you don't know how exactly it just does i suppose mm -hmm. yeah all right that, that, moving on all right yeah. Well, oh no no, that's next, it. That's it. Next subsection, uh, the kingdom of uncertainty. Of course, this is about Heisenberg, who says we must tear out, or one must tear out one's eyes to look at subatomic particles. Paradoxically, you can't see them with your eyes. You have to use matrix mechanics, basically mathematical equations right right yeah uh he is heisenberg strenuously objects to visualizations and metaphors like waves and particles and so on right he, so those are those are metaphors at best are not accurate depictions of what's actually happening in the subatomic level right so he's insisted that it is accessible only through mathematical abstraction which harkens back to grothendieck right in the previous section right mm. um uh uh the underpinnings of all things are is mathematical abstraction rather than something that can be fully conceptualized right through metaphor or visualization i was thinking of the actual term quantum mechanics you know quantum uh means how much it's related to quantity so it suggests numbers doesn't it it suggests mm -hmm. mathematics Right. Like observable right. phenomena are not really the point. It's more more about computations, matrices, which are difficult to understand. Although yeah. you know, Schrodinger himself used math, right? Like he apparently the the wave uh function includes an imaginary number. Uh, so that that just makes it even more obscure for a non-specialist like me. To, uh, it would be interesting to talk to those who understand these ideas better than us, right? Uh, physicists and mathematicians, right? Um, I would love to hear their take on this book, right? Yeah. I think they'd have some interesting things to say. But yes, uh, in or terms Cormac of... Cormac McCarthy, who, right, as I right. think I mentioned, is and you probably know this, interested in science. And uh, I, I saw a talk with him online and he discusses basically every person in this book. Like he knows everything about them, isn't all he, their theories. Isn't he pals with, isn't he pals with quantum uh, 
those who sort of delve into these realms, quantum yeah, scientists like and so the, on. Like at the Santa Fe Institute he where he, he has he a residency. He doesn't residency. want to hang out with literary. He doesn't no. want to hang out with literary people. He wants no. to hang out with the mathematicians and physicists. I that's think right. that, that's, that's pretty interesting. And apparently his new book books might have something to do with that, but that maybe that's for another podcast. Uh, well, but let's, in terms let's of the, have him on to discuss that. Sure, sure. Or, you know, read his books and talk about them. Uh, the new ones, that is. But anyway, uh, yeah, this move into pure mathematics uh, while he's on the island in the earlier uh, part, uh, we're told that all that remained were numbers, a landscape as sterile as that which separated the two ends of Heligoland. So the, the, the idea of sterility, right, at the heart of things, perhaps, or unknowability, opacity, right? Which, which at the same that. time is holy. Heligoland means holy land, right? right so right, there's a, right. there's like a sacred nothingness or sacred sterility, like the desert. Aren't we told that there were some uh, bombs dropped on there during World War II, or am I misremembering? Uh, right? Yeah, something called Operation Big Bang. Like even after right, Germany right. surrendered, they, right? The, that's it. The that's Brits it. and I guess the U.S. bombed the shit out of that place anyway. Yeah, which was already just barren rocks. And then um, he has, Labatut has Heisenberg in a later section, essentially have a hallucinatory moment where he has visions of um, that future uh, atomic apocalypse, right? So um, uh, there we have the scientist mystic as a kind of clairvoyant, someone who presciently sees, you know, the future well, another destruction another... is caused in part by quantum physics, isn't it? So... Yeah, and another mystic vision. I mean, right. that's completely fictionalized, I assume. But he basically right. he basically has a premonition of Hiroshima, which right. he didn't exactly. believe possible. He didn't think, you know, he was put in charge. The Nazis uh, put him in charge of the nuclear program, and he told them, "No, I don't think it's possible to." develop a nuclear bomb and when he first heard the news of hiroshima he didn't believe it according right. to this but right. um right. you mentioned before uh bohr's complementarity which uh heisenberg objected to but bohr felt that rather than working to resolve the contradictions between the two approaches that is uh schrodinger and um Heisenberg's approach is right uh he embraced them he embraced the contradictions uh, he he seems to take the an almost hegelian view right like you have thesis antithesis and that leads to a synthesis right uh it, i i looked this up today he he actually had a crest made for his family and the Latin motto on his crest was contraria sunt complementa, opposites are complementary. And the mm. image, oh. the image on his crest was the Taoist symbol of yang and yin. Ah, there we go. So, so Very again, nice. there's that that influence of of Eastern thought which embraces paradox in a way that right. in a way that uh, you know, Einstein apparently couldn't, right. you know, it's like right. we have to live in the realm of uncertainty. We have to be comfortable with uncertainty and paradox and admit right. that we don't understand everything and that's okay. Right. Or maybe it's not okay, but regardless, it doesn't matter. You, you have to deal with it. Right. So Heisenberg, when he has the, uh, you know, this breakdown in this later section of the novel, right? And he is, I believe, unable to sleep. And he's pursued by some strange man in black in a bar who seems to be after him. Uh, and this man, and this, this is straight out of a dream, right? A kind of nightmare, nightmarish vision, right? This man tells him, it is obvious you are possessed, that you are enthralled to your intellect as a degenerate is enthralled to a woman's cunt. You are bewitched, Professor. You've been sucked inside your own head. And then the, the man says, tell me, Professor, when did all this madness begin? When did we cease to understand the world? Right. So there's that, the haunting uh, reference to the 
heart of the novel, right? Um, and the uh, metaphysical and existential crisis that I think Labatut is evoking in all these well, and strange, here, surreal here, scenes. Here is that mystery man's comment on scientists like Heisenberg. He says, and to whom do we owe this magnificent inferno, if not to you, to people mm. like you? Magnificent so, inferno. Yeah, once again, you know, the the dangers of scientific discovery, this this right. uh, this uh, project, which was meant to liberate us, at least in theory, uh could be and could end up being our yeah could end up being right. our destruction. It's a great it's a great little section yeah yeah. Well, uh, there are a couple of things about that encounter in the bar. Uh, Heisenberg notices something metallic flash in the man's hand, the mystery man's hand. Later, we find out it's the glimmer of a knife blade. Like mm. the guy's threatening him and demanding right. that he drink the green liquid that he pours, right. which I assume is absinthe, right? Right. Is that what you it think. is? Right. I imagine, but he drinks it, right? Doesn't he? I believe. And yeah, uh, he again he the idea of inebriation, it. inebriation, intoxication, hallucination, right? Altered states. You know, altered you can't, states. You can't arrive. You can't access these ideas with normal consciousness you need right. you need some kind of disruption uh or change of or the conventional state right yeah you need a different perspective which is sometimes provided by um you know substances whether alcohol or we, we talked about the influence of meth uh in you know uh section one prussian blue right uh but there's also reference to the artists and poets and criminals at this cd bar right. that go there for their cocaine and hashish you know right right so here i guess we have the metaphor of uh addiction i suppose right scientific obsession is a kind of addiction and only through that addiction does one break through into new realms of unsettling discovery mm -hmm. good stuff and this is the way he this is what makes the book a kind of metaphysical adventure right and where the drama comes out of right uh the way he's establishing all these parallels uh, scientific inquiry uh you know imagination obsession madness delirium mysticism uh, etc well, I'll just note that, uh, you know, this experience is described as the night of his epiphany. And you mentioned before mm. that Labatut calls himself an epiphany junkie, was it? An epiphany junkie. Yeah. That's what he, uh, that's what he's after in, in fiction. Uh, and I suppose in life, perhaps, who knows, but certainly that's what draws him, uh, to writing and to, to the kinds of reading that he enjoys. An epiphany yeah. junkie. Well, there are quite a few. what these men are, indeed. Yeah, there are quite a few epiphanies in this book. All right, in the next section, God and Dice, we've, we've uh, discussed we've most, pretty much. most of this already, but it's the fifth Solvay Conference. All the big names in physics arrive, and the Copenhagen interpretation is victorious basically so bohr and right. heisenberg seem to win the debate they say that like right. the moon in buddhism a particle does not exist it is the act of measuring that makes it a real object this reminds me of the the uh i guess it's a kind of proverb or it's a kind of uh philosophical question or thought ex experiment i guess but it, it kind of has proverbial uh resonance right like uh, you've heard if uh this question if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it does it does it really happen i mean this is this is basically like uh a restatement of schrodinger's cat right like uh mm. 
isn't it the observation of an event that makes an event makes it an event that right. seems to be what they're what they're arguing we are actors yeah, he, in a game between man and the world right right yeah it's, it's summed up beautifully uh, when we're told what they were proposing was a ruthless rupture with tradition physics ought not to concern itself with reality but rather with what we can say about reality the being of atoms and their elementary particles was not like that of the objects of everyday experience they live in a world of possibilities heisenberg explained they are not things but possibilities the transition from the possible to the real only occurred during the act of observation or measurement there it is and reality does not exist as something separate from the act of observation right 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 and that's what Einstein so objected to, right? Yeah. And uh, that uh, idea is, uh, I guess, revisited in the epilogue, which uh, we've already discussed. So I think we've made yeah. our way through section four of this great book. Again, we're talking about Labatut's we'll When We Cease to Understand the world are we pronouncing his name correctly benjamin labatut, labatut, labatut. i think so ben, Le, benjamin labatut benjamin yes. or i i say benjamin I mean, I mean, like benjamin yes benjamin in spanish for sure benjamin labatut, labatut. Yeah. yeah okay yeah. all well, right we have we have one more section section five is called the night gardener very short so next time we'll talk about that and maybe wrap things up talking more about Labatut and related issues and uh, anything else that's on your mind. Maybe you'd Fantastic. like to talk about how, you know, Schrodinger's predilections are similar to those of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> maybe he, maybe, Perhaps. He, maybe he asked, maybe he asked the daughter, <laughs> of the doctor oh. at the hospital where he stayed to suck his tongue who knows nah, that is uh that is a yeah, shocking little video disturbing Jeez. indeed for sure for sure i look forward to it that sounds great all right people we'll see you next time on books are burning